What up, guys? Welcome to the Jiu-Jitsu Podcast episode. I can't remember, but we've got Robert Drysdale on the podcast today. So Robert Drysdale was on the podcast last time he wrote a book, uh, Opening Close Guard, which was you know getting into some of the history, some of the surprising history of Jiu-Jitsu. This one is, is the book title is The Rise and Evolution of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Um, he sent me a message several months ago and told me that, you know, he had the book out and he was interested in being on the podcast again. And I was like, okay, let me go read the book first. Cause the first one was, there was a lot of stuff to talk about. I was like, let me go read this one. And I got into it and read it. And again, the book, what it goes into is kind of some of the unknown history. Um, for a lot of us, there's a couple of books that he cites and uses in there that are uh, in Portuguese, right? Mm -hmm. That obviously if you're American and you speak English and you don't have access to the Portuguese language, then you're not going to have read it. Um, and so again, he takes a lot of the, the source material and, and uses that and interprets it and also takes his experiences with jujitsu and everything else with these interviews that he's gotten. Um, he said it took him a lot longer to create this book, but again, it, it shares an unknown history of jujitsu stuff that like we don't know about like for instance in this podcast you'll learn about who like started group classes so group classes were not always a thing that's not how you originally trained jujitsu right. i didn't know that mm -hmm. i was like i figured that's just what everybody did it wasn't what everybody did it didn't used to be that also it didn't used to be called brazilian jujitsu or even gracie jujitsu it was just jujitsu Right. Like, and then things changed a little bit, right? Like the way that people saw it changed and there was different things. And I didn't even realize how niche of a sport it was. We'll talk about this on the podcast as well. Like, again, as Americans, you, if you're listening to this, or if you're a Westerner, like living in Europe or something, you probably, if you know more about the history than maybe you don't, but you probably have this idea that man, jujitsu was probably huge in Brazil back in the day. It wasn't, mm -hmm. it was tiny, it was small, it was niche. Um, and it wasn't until the UFC with the the Gracie, you know, um, Hoist Gracie winning and Horian's basically Horian's uh, vision of using the UFC as a platform that it changed. And he'll talk about we'll talk about this a little bit on the podcast. And so a lot of really interesting stuff that a lot of us, uh, the, the way that the culture is and everything else, it didn't. You just didn't know about it. And I mm -hmm. thought that was fascinating from a from a connect the dot standpoint. So I'm as a as a person, I'm a history geek. I love history. I have mm. tons of history books in my library. And again, I love history for the simple fact of being able to connect the dots. I like seeing how things got to where they are because a lot of times we see where we're at and we just, that's what we know. Yeah. Right. We're right there. We're in the forest. And then when you read a history book that goes into something, it takes you a bit back and you can look back at how things got to where they are. Um, and a lot of times, if you can go back far enough, you can a lot of times get become a little bit more objective to it, right? You know, like with the, the times that we live in, one of my actually one of my history um, teachers in, in college, he talked about the fact that like, you can't really get an objective view of what's going on right now. He's like, you just can't because everybody has a bias. Everybody has an opinion, a belief, it's yep. whatever. He's like, you really can't get a decent objective opinion until like, like, after everybody's dead, you know, like, mm. like after like, like 70 or 80 years when really nobody has a dog in the fight yeah. and they can just look at it and say, well, this is what happened. I mean, you'll still get some biases there because people, they, they, you know, they have their thoughts and things like that, but you can get a far more sub uh, objective view than what you can get on the, what's the ground now. So anyway, I hope you guys enjoy the podcast with Robert. Um, and again, by the way, for any of you guys that, you know, he talks about this a little bit, but when we did the first podcast with him, um, some of you guys sent me nasty messages. Sent you? Yeah. You got nasty messages? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because again, because again, what's part of the book, and again, this might ruffle feathers, is that he's not, in, 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 if you actually read the book, it's not at, he's not talking badly about anybody. There's no ad hominem. He's just going through the source materials, the interviews, and things like that, and talking about what these people actually did, the real stuff, right? And, again the a lot of times the there's a bit of myth that was associated with jiu-jitsu back in the day um with like you know alio and carlos and all that stuff in the beginning where they came from who they learned from everything else you know what their connections with maeda right these things aren't actually probably true right now that said the myth served its purpose right it, yes. it, the story served it well and it helped keep them alive and again robert gives a lot of credit to carlos and elio for other reasons um and so talk about on the podcast but i just say this because i know sometimes like you know as humans we get very attached to ideas yeah and when someone comes along and says hey wait a second this idea isn't actually true it's like oh wait a second you know you have reactions to that i know that my reaction was kind of like huh you know, but I don't look at it as a bad thing because I'm like, you know, I, I'm it's it's like um, 
it's like when you learn history as a kid in, in the United States, I'm sure it's very similar to other places. When you learn history in the, as a kid, at least it grew up in the 90s in the United States, you learn this really like fragmented piece of history and they talk about your history professor mm -hmm. or your your um, your historical figures like these people like these perfect people like when you read about abraham lincoln and uh you know like walking miles to return a penny or something and um george washington chopping down the cherry tree whatever you know all this yeah. stuff but then when you actually go read about them and you get this far more interesting view of who that person was, right? Like, it's like, oh, that person's really interesting, right? Like when you read about, say like from someone like Theodore Roosevelt, you know, people know about some things about him, but then you read about all these like little things, like when he was talking about, when he invited Booker T. Um, Washington to the, uh, to the White House to dine, right? First black man that ever got to, to dine at the White House. When he invited him, he said at first he had reservations. He was fearful of doing it. And he said, I, and then he got kind of angry at himself. I can't believe I was not going to do that because of this man's color. I have to invite him now. And you, you see him battling with like what other people think, which is something we all do. Right. And so you see the humanity in them. Yeah. And so I think it's more fascinating than not. So you see, again, going back to it in the book, I think you get, a, you don't get to that kind of depth into it, but you do get to see in the two books that he's created some of this who these guys really were the these fighters and these the the gracie clan and what they brought to the table and again maybe it's not exactly what you thought it was but at the same time it's no less impressive and important yeah it's, it's super tough. important for yeah. what we have and so again i just share that with you guys so again there 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 will be some some things like that if you guys didn't read the first one this might come as a shock to some of you guys but again don't be upset about it if, go read the book if you yes. if you really want to get angry at him or me or whatever go read the book and then then make a, a good opinion other than just like getting angry because you heard one thing on a podcast uh not that i i'm not that upset if you guys send me the angry messages you can do that if you want um that said thank you guys as always for joining us on this podcast and big thanks to our sponsors for helping make the podcast happen if you guys have not checked out charlotte's web cbd i encourage you to do so it's my favorite cbd product that's out there i've used several different ones over the years um and it's been my go-to for gosh probably about four or five years now i can't remember it's kind of time gets fuzzy when you get old but Again, it's a really cool product for as far as CBD goes because, again, there's a lot of different products out there in the market that do not do the extra stringent testing to ensure the, uh, the, the purity and the actual substance that's in the product that you're taking. So, for instance, it's an FDA unregulated product. So when you get a CBD bottle, a gummy or whatever it might be, they don't have to necessarily make sure everything that is in the bottle is what's labeled on there, right? I mean, they they have a little bit of wiggle room because again, it's not regulated. Charles Webb goes the extra mile, everything's third party tested and they have great products. I like their tinctures, their gummies, all that stuff's good. And for some of you guys that run into some, you know, different soreness from time to time, my shoulders were sore for a little bit. So I've been rubbing the balm on it and it helps out. Sometimes after training, I'd be a little bit sore in the muscles and I could rub the, the balm on it or rub it on my neck. Sometimes after I, I remember Saturday, Sunday, I went to the gym and I did like an open mat. Mm -hmm. One of the guys was kind of yanking on my neck with a guillotine. After I got home, I was like, ah, kind of pulled it a little bit, rubbed some balm on it. It was good. And their, their CBD balm is, um, it's pretty interesting stuff. So anyway, if you want to check out any of their products, everything at their website, charlottesweb.com, go there. And again, when you find something you like, you can get 30% off. We have a new code, 30% off with Chujitsu 30 at checkout. So when you find the product you like, Chujitsu 30, and you'll get 30% off uh, with the discount. Also, thanks to Epic Roll for supporting the podcast. Um, if you guys have not, or if you're not on my Chew Crew email list, well, you should be, but uh, then you may not know. But as of right now, when you're listening to this, I still have some available on my website. Um, if you go to like jujitsu.net or whatever, find me on Instagram. I'm probably posting about it. I have some gear made by Epic Roll right now on sale. Uh, we've got both the jujitsu rash guards. I've got shorts and I've got like shorter shorts. And again, one of my favorite uh, things about the stuff that, the, that Matt makes at Epic Roll, um, I particularly love the shorts. Again, everything's good quality. I've have, I have the prototype that he originally gave me. I think it was back in like 2020 maybe. I still have that. It's still going strong. It still holds up into regular training. And again, I like the shorter shorts personally, but I love his, his nogi shorts because there's no Velcro. There's no ripping across. There's no, um, you know, losing that Velcro grip to where you have to throw the shorts away. And they're very comfortable. 
rash guards fit great uh sizing wise they fit basically like a t-shirt mm -hmm. i wear a large t-shirt i wear a large rash guard um, but again you can get those at my website but if you want to check out because maybe you're listening to this sometime in the future not around november 2023 then go to matt's website at epicrollbjj.com look through his um catalog look at all the stuff that he has t-shirts shorts rash guards geese everything in anything jujitsu related he has it and if you want to save 20 percent off use the promo code jujitsu 20 for 20 percent off the order also thanks to manscape for supporting the podcast i am in need of a little manscaping it's uh mm, I'm, get, I'm getting my winter coat <laughs> i see where you're at did you know this i don't know if you know this do you know that like um horses grow coats of fur in the winter no i didn't know this i don't I so like for instance like you know when you see a horse are all like smooth sure right so like in the winter time if you if you don't put your horse and keep him blanketed and stuff like that then they will grow fur huh. and so like smiley right now like our horse he like he he's a he's a just a he's a fuzzy little fella oh he's a fuzzy fella he, he it's so cool because they get like really bushy huh um yeah so it's it's, it's, I didn't it's know that. so it's interesting to see like when the uh like they have different coats that come in yeah so like right when it starts to get kind of cold their body just starts to change and all of a sudden interesting they start to grow the fur and then like later on when it starts to warm up all of a sudden all that fur just starts going everywhere huh. and you'll find and, and around the barn and stuff will find bird's nests with his hair yeah um, that's fun using it but <laughs> i've got my little um i've got my little buzz going on and i need to get, get trimmed up um again manscaped is the premier men's grooming company out there they make everything from balms and lotions to shavers and trimmers and razors i mean you name it they make it everything they make is high quality everything they make is smells good i haven't had one bad product from them um it, i don't know I, there's not a whole lot else that you can say if you need a good trimmer you need a good razor you need to manscape some part of your body they are the company to check out um, again, we've we've had them on as a sponsor, and they became a sponsor because I like the products. Manscaping is not necessarily something that I initially was like. You know what I want to talk about? I wanted to talk about trimming your body hair. That's right. But then you get a good product, and you're like, it's a pretty damn good product, so I don't mind talking about mm -hmm. it. So again, if you guys want to check it out, go to their website, manscaped.com. Look through everything. They've got a really cool package. It's like the I'm, I don't know what the number is. Is it four point oh now? It's a five point oh. Five point oh. Five point oh so, is the the new one. It's got the interchangeable heads. The interchangeable. On it. Okay, That's so awesome. So they you know they keep stepping up their game every time. But they've got a uh, performance package, a package that'll give you the trimmer. It'll give you some other little things and things like that. That's kind of like a good start. That's what I started with when they started us off with the uh, the sponsorship uh, for the podcast. And that's what I started with. I like the product. So again, if you guys go to their website, you can check that out and you can get 20% uh, off the order and get free shipping. If you go to their website at manscaped.com and use promo code chujitsu20 at checkout. Also, thanks to you guys for supporting us at the Patreon. And if those of you that are listening would like to continue to support the podcast as well, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash the Jiu-Jitsu podcast. And upon joining, we'll give you access to an exclusive library of content that has a little snippet from every single guest that we've ever had on the podcast. Many of those uh, snippets are specific tips that you can implement into your training tomorrow. Something like an idea from a mentor in Jiu-Jitsu, right? That's the idea behind it. There's also other bonus stuff like a ad-free version version of this podcast should you want one there's also recordings of seminars that i've done warmer routines that eugene dr eugene has put together dr eugene physical therapist has put together um and also by the way guys you listening to this if you guys ever have trouble with injuries or like you're getting some like some stuff's going on like go message him because like someone messaged me the other day they said that they're like they were having trouble with like something related to their back or whatever mm -hmm. and i'm like dude i don't know like like because they had some prognosis from the doctor I'm like go talk to eugene he's the guy right like it's like he's like legitimately the guy that's like you know anytime i have something wrong with my hair check this out like is there something i need to be worried about is there something i can do he's the dude to talk to uh, knows his stuff um yeah well for people that need, want to get a hold of me instagram the jujitsu therapist you can send me a message there you can email me jujitsu therapist at gmail.com Jiu-Jitsu, J-I-U-J-I-T-S-U, therapist, T-H-E-R-A-P-I-S-T. There you go. And if you guys want to support the podcast again, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash the Jiu-Jitsu podcast. And last but not least, if you guys are not getting my daily email, what's wrong with you? You should be getting, you should it. Be getting a daily it's email. It's good. Um, but you can get it at jujitsu.net slash join. Now, I know a lot of emails like 
I'm a part of them. I'll let you know. I will I will send things. I will tell you about offers that I have. I will tell you about products I have coming up, events I have going up, and I will give you a link in there to buy stuff from me should you get the urge to do so. But that said, in a lot of the emails that I'm sharing with you guys, a lot of times they're stories from training, they're ideas for training, they're videos or things like that that I think might be useful to you. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of times on Sundays, um, my daily email is based on like books that I'm reading. Like there was one, I think the last week was Masonius Rufus, a stoic. Um, and then I was sharing a Marcus Aurelius quote again, another stoic this Sunday. Um, so again, it, it, it goes the gamut. It's not just like, Hey, Chewy's got a, you know, instructional, I mean, I have that stuff, but it's trying to give you ideas for training and there will be offers. So again, if, if, if me making money doing jujitsu bothers you, I definitely wouldn't sign up. But if you're, if you're, if you're okay with that and you'd like to get some cool stuff and join the I think 30,000 or 40,000, whatever it is, I, I don't look, um, that read it on a daily basis, then join up today and be glad to have you. And you can do so by going to my website at chujitsu.net slash join. And upon joining, I'll also give you a gift of a couple of free eBooks and a video. The eBooks go into one, how to train to break up uh, plateaus with your sticky points in training. And then the other one is going to be on developing a jujitsu game plan and the video will go through it as well. So again, you get those uh, resources for free by joining up and you get my daily email and you can unsubscribe at any time. So with that said, guys, thanks so much for joining us. So let's go ahead and talk to Robert Drysdale. <music> Kind of st stopping at the last book and then starting on this one what was kind of the idea behind you know writing another book after you completed the first one um i think the the main thing really with the main motivation was i enjoyed it i really enjoyed the process of creating sitting down i'm actually really happy sitting down in front of a computer and typing mm -hmm. i i would do it more if i had more time yep. Teaching, I'm teaching three or four classes a day these days, running a gym, running the team, traveling every weekend for either a tournament or a seminar or something. So I don't have a lot of free time, but I enjoy the process. I think that was one of the motivations. The second motivation was, I think that while I was, as I was writing the first, all these side stories to jujitsu that really didn't fit into the first book, but I touched on, if you pay attention, I touch on them in the first book, but I think I'm able to articulate a bit further in the second book. And I, I, I feel that they were like, there's a lot more to be said here than just a paragraph or two. So mm -hmm. I dedicated like a whole chapter on some of those topics. Right. And and then Carlson Gracie, of course, you know, I end the first book with a homage to, to Carlson. But I feel like it wasn't enough. Like, just like saying, oh, this guy was an awesome guy. He was a great coach. Doesn't do justice to what he did for jujitsu. So the second book had all those overlapping motivations and um yeah, I, I enjoyed that. The second book was a lot more work than the first, like mm -hmm. double, like it was a lot more work. So it took like a year of like all of my free time, pretty much just working every day on it. Like it was a lot, but I, it was rewritten at least twice, you know, like mm -hmm. there was, there was a lot more work than the first partially because I, I made the mistake of editing the book myself, which I'll never do again. That was <laughs> the dumbest thing I've ever decided to do. And, um, but yeah, the finished product, I think is, you know, so far the, the reviews have been good. So yeah. What's the reception been like? Cause I know like with the first one, you know, you're, you know, you're taking the, the sort of mythology that we have with jujitsu that we all kind of came up with and you're kind of pulling some of that back and like, well, here's what actually happened. And here's the reality of the situation. What's been the reception from these two books that you've written? I know the first one, I, I had people messaging me when we had you on last time telling me it was terrible. Like this guy is a terrible person for talking bad about Alio and whatever else, you know, which I did. I didn't, when I actually read the books, I was like, he's not actually talking bad about him. You give him his rightful due. You know, he yeah. was a, he was a fighter, you know, he, it is what it is. But what has the reception been for you from these two different books that you wrote? Um, I think it's been mixed. I think in general, it's been positive. I think that mm -hmm. people who read the book tend to see that. I mean, I think it's impossible to be absolutely unbiased. I mean, if you have an opinion on morality, you're going to be biased. Sure, of course. If you have an opinion on like anything, I mean, so there's some level of bias everywhere. But I think I did a fair job and not really... There's no ad hominem attacks, you know, like I, I think that no. some people get blown out of proportion. Others didn't get their due credit. And that was the purpose. I think I know it came from a good place. It didn't come from a place of inflammatory, you know, looking to be sensationalist or controversial just for controversy's sake. I know it came from a good place because 
man, I really, you know, I, I, when I heard of George Gracie, I was like, man, this is, this guy fought more than every single, but probably all the Gracie brothers from that generation combined. Yeah. You know, and no one's ever heard of him. You know, he's arguably the first MMA fight in modern history was George Gracie. So, uh, you know, I think that that's those things like were motivating me at the time. I thought it was super interesting. But going back to your question, I think the people who read the book tend to side with me. The people who didn't read it were are still very skeptic. It's like clearly this guy must have some bad intention. Um, and it's been an uphill battle. I think that the, the tide is starting to turn after the second book because, you know, I got a Gracie on the cover. So. You know, I mean, there, there's some reviews that are contradictory. I had one guy that gave me a review on the first that called me anti Gracie. And then the second book, he called me pro Carlson Gracie. It's just like, which one is it, man? Like you can't, you know, so I think in general, it's been positive. I've had a lot of like, like qualified readers, like people in, you know, that, you know, in high places, like, you know, like academics write me and they say they enjoyed the book and they felt that I was fair and, and, and to the point, um, I made a lot of good friends over this. That's probably my favorite thing about having written these books is how many friends I made over just like people that wrote me. And then, you know, we had a lot of things in common, turns out, and books in common and, you know, views in common. So that was probably the bigger thing. But it was it was in general positive. But I don't know about the negative. A lot of the people who, you know, dislike the book aren't necessarily reviewing it or overly right. critical about it, just kind of keeping it to themselves, you know. I think there were kind of two camps, essentially. You had the Alio camp and you had the, you know, the Carlson camp. I mean, that was kind of like you you do a good job showing kind of the contrast uh, of how yeah. they almost kind of like how they needed each other, but also how they were so different. You know, can you can you kind of explain a little bit, you know, maybe even the importance of of Alio's gym and how he ran things and also how how uh, Carlson ran you know things, which obviously the competitive nature of jujitsu, the the tournament style that, you know, the Valley Tudo, all that stuff that, that he was a part of. You know, man, this is something that the first book, I'm still still caught up with the theme of the lineage, right? If you pay mm -hmm. close attention to the book, I'm basically questioning what has been 100% of jiu-jitsu history. So if 10 years ago you ask anyone anything about jiu-jitsu history, they would have gone, oh, you know, Maeda taught Carlos because he was an unruly child, yada, yada, yada. Mm -hmm. And I start with that because that's all we knew. That was 100% of the story. So I dedicate, if I really think about it, more time than I should have to a topic that really isn't that important. At the end of the day, how relevant is it who taught Carlos Gracie? It's what he did that matters, not who taught him. Mm -hmm. You know, I think Maeda's role in all this is grossly exaggerated to begin with. You know, the evidence points to Brazilians having taught, you know, a Brazilian having taught Carlos anyway. So it's it's not it's but we get caught up in these lineage discussions and like, wait a second here, man. Isn't it more interesting to understand how the grace is separated from judo, how that process took place? Like, I never thought about this. I didn't it, it, it dawned on me like I was halfway through writing the second book and I'm looking at these rule sets and I realized that analyzing the rule sets was a great way of understanding what their interpretation of jiu-jitsu mm -hmm. was at the time mm. because the rules set frame your practice right to yeah. determine what you believe jiu-jitsu to be and you can see it change and it slowly evolving away from judo until we are what we are today and another aspect of that i mean i think that's far more relevant than who taught carlos i'll give you another one it's the helio and carlos carlson uh, rivalry like you mentioned mm -hmm. their rivalry was probably one of the it was i was the political backdrop to jiu-jitsu for decades and no one had even heard of it. Like most people don't even know it existed. I, I was somewhat aware of it, but I, I completely uh, de-emphasized it in the first book. And in the second book, after I'm talking to these old timers, like the second wave of practitioners, right, from like 67 onwards, I mean, it's clear that Carlson and Helio were like at each other's throats over who had the best students, you know. And, and it turned out that, you know, Carlson had a better model because it's the model that we practice today. You know, Carl, Carlos Gracie Jr. called it a civil war between two generals, right? So Helio focused on private lessons, wealthier upper class individuals, no group classes, no competition class. And Carlson essentially taught how we train today, which mm -hmm. is throw a bunch of animals in the room, set the clock and say, go try to kill each other. You know, and that's we know we all know that now it's it's, it's common sense today. It wasn't common sense then. This is the fastest way to learn is just being at war all the time. And Carlson being inspired by, by cockfighting as he was, he, I think he understood that this is how you train fighters. And some of the clash actually started. I had someone reach out to me after 
I finished the book and because, you know, someone really high up in the family, I'm not going to mention who because it wasn't off. But the real reason why Carlson left was because he was trying to teach a more competition version of jiu-jitsu, some more advanced positions on the ground, stuff that would actually work in a Valetudo fight. And Helio was set on teaching the self-defense curriculum. Like he didn't want to drift from the self-defense curriculum into a more sport combative aspect of jiu-jitsu. And they were butting heads a lot. And then Helio would catch Carlson teaching something that Helio didn't want him to teach. And they'd be fighting over what Carlson is teaching. So Carlson kind of had it, you know, and then he decided to leave and open his own place and teach how he saw fit. And he went on to dominate the jiu-jitsu landscape in Brazil for three decades. If you look at jiu-jitsu history from the 1950s up to Hoyce Gracie, Carlson is by far the leading figure in jiu-jitsu history in Brazil. Like, not there's no one comes even close to him. I mean, Hollis. But again, Hollis is just copying what Carlson did. He's treading in his footsteps, you know. He mm-hmm. He was a very important character in the history. Like he was the ideal rival for for Carlson, but he's basically doing what teaching how Carlson taught. And I think a lot of people miss that as well, you know. So, I think these are far more relevant aspects of the story than you know who taught Carlos. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and there's there's random things in there that I think, especially for Americans that got into it, you know, later in the '90s or early 2000s, like we didn't know about, like the idea of. Brazilian jiu-jitsu or Gracie jiu-jitsu back in the day just simply being jiu-jitsu like it wasn't it didn't have the stamp on it like it was interesting to me when you talked about it in the book that you know jiu-jitsu was obviously more developed than it was in America but it wasn't like because we when we saw like UFC one for instance we saw it come in there we thought that like everybody in Brazil was practicing this stuff like everybody could fight everybody could fight on the ground but you know in the book you talk about it it was like this little small little niche yeah. in the south zone of Rio yeah. and then as soon as the UFC exploded well it exploded in the US on a very small scale but down in Brazil you had all of these practitioners that were just waiting in line saying oh I, I have a job doing jiu-jitsu now sign me up yeah and I thought that was a really interesting aspect that I never knew about before yeah, no, for sure. And and a lot of, you know, uh, non-Brazilians miss this, but Brazilians know this perfectly well. Pedro Pano, you know, two-time absolute, you know, mm-hmm. world champion, Pedro Pano, mm-hmm. he's from Rio, but a different zone. He's, a, he's I don't know, I think he's from the north zone. I can't remember where he's from in Rio, but he's not from the south zone. Okay. And he said he had never heard of jiu-jitsu up to Hoist Gracie, and he's in Rio. Yeah. So okay. just to give you an idea of how niche this really was, it's like a half a dozen gyms in the South Zone competing against each other in small tournaments. But, you know, I think this is like before anyone ever calls me an anti grace or a hater. Like I, I challenge that because I think I give credit in some places where not even they gave themselves credit. Mm-hmm. I think the most astonishing piece of this whole history is that someone that they would stick to their narrative and yeah. their view of things for four, five decades when no one was paying attention. Mm -hmm. Now, imagine you start a business and it's not doing well. You might try, if you're a tough guy, three or four years, and after three or four years of trying a business that's not doing great, you probably, you know what? It's not for me. I'm going to go somewhere else. I cannot imagine myself sticking to a view of things that was so at odds with how the world practiced and understood martial arts, especially with judo being as powerful and as influential as it was for four or five decades, sticking to your guns and saying, this is how we're going to do it. We're going to do it different. We're going to do it better. We have something that no one else has. You just wait to see one day it's going to pan out. And they did it. Yeah, <laughs> it's, a, yeah. it's incredible. The more you think about the stories, like the more amazing it is. Like it's, you, there's no way that someone would, this is why it drives me crazy when people say like, oh, jiu is popular because of me. I'm like, bro, you, you don't fully understand the heavy lifting that went on in the 40s 50s, 60s, 70s in Brazil to separate from judo at a time when no one was paying attention and the whole world was against them. It was well, even to stay alive, well, right? just, just to keep it going. How do you convince someone in Brazil to train some uh, Gracie Jiu Jitsu? I mean, you had judo, man. It's in the Olympics. You had Kung Fu with Bruce Lee. Mm-hmm. And then you later had Elvis Presley blowing up karate. You mm-hmm. know, you have all these things and and, and they stuck to it. And I mean, it's, it really isn't. I mean, the UFC really was the turning point in the story. Horion Gracie really was the the key figure to really, you know, blow this 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 amazing story onto the world stage. But you know, I, I the more I think about it, the more amazed I am at their resilience. I, I I'm convinced that Carlos and Helio's biggest contribution to jiu-jitsu were not technical; they were political in the sense that they kept the troops in line long enough for their children to grow into maturity for their children to actually 
create the world that we live in today. Not only Gracie's, but primarily Carlos and Hugo's children were the ones who did it. You know, so I, and I think that's that's not a small feat. I think it's truly amazing. Well, and not just like. It, it, you know, you think about like with that, not just holding down and keeping the troops in line, but then formulating those troops. I mean, because, again, you know, when you look at the way that Elio and Carlos raised those families, yeah. I mean, they were raising them for one purpose. I mean, you're yeah. raising them for this job. And like you said, to do that for 40 years, that's really impressive. And yeah. to resist the because judo was growing so widely. Um, and so crazy. It's like, it, it's, uh, it's impressive. And and I think that, and then one of the other things that I think you gave credit to Elio about it was, you know, at a time when a lot of people were doing like worked matches, like they were yeah. doing these works and stuff, he, he refused to do them. Like he was like, I mean, let's, let's fight, let's do it. But he wasn't going to go in there and like actually throw the match or whatever. He was a fighter and he was willing to do that. Yeah. Helio was, you know, he was stubborn. He was set in his ways, which were during that time were probably for a specific time in Jiu Jitsu history, there were good qualities to keep the small group united. Mm -hmm. going, we're going to do it our ways. And he hated fake fights because I think he didn't, I think he had this view that the fight had to be as real as possible. And I think that's the one thing that Healy and Carlson had in common is that they had this, this premise of the reality was a fundamental feature of what we call Gracie Jiu Jitsu, Jiu Jitsu, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, mm -hmm. up to recent, really. Like it didn't change until much later. Like we're, you know, when, when, you know, I talk about this at the end of the book, like when the slaps were removed, this whole new avenue for sport of jiu-jitsu was created where it wasn't necessarily, it wasn't a priority for jiu-jitsu to be real anymore, right? But they had that, like they wanted to, the diff, the, their differentiation, uh, the, the, the different point between them and judo was that they were real. They felt that they were doing us closer to a real fight, and it really was. It was a mar more martial version of judo, especially as judo, you know, became more of a sport, and less and less of a martial art over time. And I think they were aware of that. And that was, I mean, that was probably the biggest, the biggest strength of their system was like keeping it grounded in reality. Yeah. What is there anything from writing this book that maybe you had some ideas on jujitsu that something changed or completely kind of maybe changed your mind about what you thought the history of jujitsu was? I kind of had, I mean, I got this from Shockey. I cannot give Shockey by Roberto Pedrera enough credit. Like people credit me as being a great historian. I'm not a great historian. I'm a blue belt at this. If I give myself a lot of credit, I'm a either a good blue belt or a shitty purple belt. <laughs> um, but, you know, like there are people that are professionals that have been doing this for decades, you know. So I, there's no way I'm not influenced by Shockey. It's clear. I, I'm the first one to say it. But there's a lot of, there's there's a theme there. And I pick up on that theme, which is, the cyclical aspect of martial arts, of fashion in general, right? Like things come and go. Mm -hmm. I start the book with the circus. I did it for a reason because I do think in a lot of ways we're kind of going back to that. <laughs> you know, like it's, you see the martial arts become like, you see a lot of professional events. It's not about, it's not a, a coliseum of gladiators, you know, engaging in battle. It's more of like, how can we sell tickets? Selling tickets sure. is the top priority. If the selling tickets is the top priority, then it's natural that the next step becomes sensationalism in order because you have to top your competition, right? right? So like you see com com uh, comedians on the on the cage now, like skits inside a cage. It's something I never even thought would be possible. Mm -hmm. We saw the PFL was doing that a while ago. We see the UFC is buying buying a power slap, which I thought was very strange for them. To That's do. a weird one. Yeah, what a weird, so, what a weird you know, like it, event move. What a what strange move for the UFC, really. I think, you know, and then there's other things like you're seeing the sensationalism and the comedy intermingling. And as long as it's selling tickets, everything is valid. So I start the book with the circus intentionally because and I start with that quote from Ecclesiastes, like there's nothing new under the sun. Like we've been through this before. Mm -hmm. We are treading in the path of judo and karate and taekwondo and we're kind of becoming what we used to criticize. And I think the cyclical aspect of, of, of martial arts, which is in shocky in between the lines. I think I pick up on that and I add a thing or two perhaps. And I think that was that was very interesting. Um the 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 role of the of like the second generation of Graces, which is something I kinda underestimated. Like Carlson Hollis and Carlos Gracie Jr., between the three of them, they really reshaped jujitsu into a whole new brand of jujitsu. Mm -hmm. Like I mean the the kind of jujitsu we're practicing today is wildly different from what these guys were doing in the 40s and 50s. Now, because we're using the same word, we're under the impression that it's the same thing. We use the word jujitsu, also it's the same thing. It's like, oh, we're just using the word. The meaning of that is changing dramatically. You know, like just like there's a there's a moment of mutation in, in between 
judo in the Gracie Academy. There's a mm -hmm. second mutation that goes on inside Carlson Gracie's Academy at the Figueiredo de Magalhães. And that right there sort of gave birth to the brand of jiu-jitsu that we're practicing today. And I say this in methodological terms, uh, technical terms, and cultural terms. I thought that was super important too. Like the beach culture that is so ingrained in jiu-jitsu, that relaxed manners, that Brazilian mm -hmm. way of doing things, flip-flops, acai, shaka, you know, like the 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 the, the bro bra kind of environment that they're on the mats. It's not judo. It's not Japanese. Mm -hmm. It's not the Gracie Academy. That's Carlson Gracie right there. You know, and I was I've, I've, I've seen this all over the world and I thought it was Brazilian, but I didn't realize that Carlson had been the one who actually introduced that into jiu-jitsu because that was him. That's how he was. That was his personality. So it, Carlson's personality played a role in shaping jiu-jitsu because at the end of the day, it was it had more appeal to the world. You know, this is why I, I mentioned this in the book, but I mean, I think Carlson is the victor in the, in the civil war against Helio. Because mm -hmm. it was his view of jiu-jitsu that had greater appeal to the world. Now, the world didn't give him credit because he had one son. And he wasn't the one who had the, the, the opportunity to tell, the to explain to the world what jiu-jitsu was. Horian did that in the 90s and everyone just went along with it. Mm -hmm. But I think that if you pay close attention, the brand of jiu-jitsu that we practice was born inside of Carlson Gracie's gym, not the Gracie Academy. Incidentally, this is something that Carlson was very aware of. When he says... Don't confuse Gracie Jiu-Jitsu with Carlson Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. He's fully aware of that. He's fully aware that even though they're still using the name Jiu-Jitsu, it is a different practice. It's I don't want to call it a new martial art, but there's definitely a fork there. So it's much like there was a fork between Judo and Gracie Jiu-Jitsu mm -hmm. in the 30s and 40s, there was another fork that took place somewhere in the early 70s in Rio inside Carlson Gracie's Academy. These people, I mean, the, the kind of clientele the methodology and the techniques that we're practicing differ dramatically. Now with Carlson, I mean, there's a lot of things to, to pull from. Are there any in your, in your sort of thinking, your opinion, your belief, are there any particular contributions to what we do? Cause again, there's, there's a lot, when you look at the book, there's so many things like I didn't know about like the group classes uh, and even the culture and everything else It's like, Oh yeah. Like all of this stuff came from this place. It's interesting how it, it, it just, uh, transmitted everywhere but yeah. is there any particular contributions that you think are extremely important or more important than the others as far as jiu-jitsu goes from carlson i think again that the beach culture i think we underestimate these things because all oh, the culture has nothing to do with it you know it, it's super important like it a martial uh, huge. Yeah, it's huge are you like, go into a gym like you know this like you go into a gym and like immediately you get a vibe from the gym and that, that culture is what's going to keep you. You come in for the techniques because you want to learn them. And that's like the perfume that attracts you. But what mm -hmm. keeps you is like the personality of the, of the people and the culture of the people of the gym, 100%. And, and, and you know, martial art is I, – I define a martial art in cultural slash philosophical terms. Jiu-Jitsu has a culture, a very specific culture that is constantly changing. That's part of the theme of the book. It doesn't have a philosophy like judo. Judo has a very specific philosophy with a purpose to it. I define it in methodological terms, how you practice that martial art, and in technical terms, which is framed by the rule set. So there's those three aspects frame a martial art, in my view. Carlson changes jiu-jitsu in all those three of those aspects. He goes from private lessons to rich individuals to democratizing it to the masses, group classes, pojada, conflict, hinya, they say in Portuguese, right, cockfighting, like you know, rooster versus rooster, go to war. That's the methodology. The culture, it's the beach culture. Relaxed manners, flip-flops, show up five minutes late. It's not the militaristic culture that Helio and Carlos had created inside the Gracie Academy. Just culturally, it's very different. And, the, I mean, these old-timers talk about it. It's, I mean, completely different crowds, completely different vibes. You know, that matters. The, that, I mean, I, I when I walk to Jiu-Jitsu Gym in, in Japan, and I mentioned this in my first book, and I see people sitting with their legs open, taping their, taking their time to tape their fingers – showing up five minutes late i'm yeah. thinking man that's that's not gracie that's not judo that's not gracie jiu-jitsu yeah, yeah. that's that's carlson gracie jiu-jitsu like that's the it's the beach brazilian aspect of you know the whole thing of being so relaxed when you're on the mats um and then in technical terms and the, the, going back to the rule set this is super important in 54 just to give an idea how these guys were really judokas in 1954 their internal rule set the chapter eight talks about the rule set right the, mm -hmm. the evolution of the rules in that 1954, they had Wazari, Osaikomi, and Ipon in the rule set. 
Now, Ipon and Osaikomi don't finish the fight, but they're awarded one full point, whereas the Vazari is half a point, right? There's no three points for passing, mm -hmm. four points for mount, four points for the back, none of that. So they still have Vazari, Ipon, and this is in 54. In 67, they remove the Vazari, and they remove the Osaikomi, and I think there's another small change. I can't remember what it was, but no four points yet, no three points, none of that. In 75, there's a huge jump mm -hmm. in the rule set. In 75, something happened between 67 and 75 in terms of their interpretation of what jiu-jitsu was. Okay? They have a rule set that is heavily influenced by Valitudo. That's why we award points in situations where you could strike down on your opponent. Neon belly, side control, mount, force. So you're at what I call the progression paradigm. You ascend in terms of your progression and you're awarded points according to situations where you could potentially strike down on your opponent. Right, so it's mimicking an MMA fight in terms of its progression, and you have four points for mount all of a sudden, four points for the back, right? And it's a big, big shift, and you see this ground orientation that didn't exist in '54. Remember, there's no ground, there's no high in terms of how you rewarded points on the ground and standing. It's one to one in '54 and '67, so there's no specificity towards the ground in terms of its evolutionary course. So you see this in 54 and 67. In 75, that changes completely. Two points for takedown, four points for mount. So you see a hierarchy in how you reward. Obviously, you know, as anyone could expect, the evolution is going to go in a direction towards where you're awarded more points, not less. So that's exactly what happened. Now, I can't prove this. There's no evidence. I don't have witnesses for this, but I suspect, this is speculation, but I, I have very strong suspicion to believe that this radical shift in 75 is due to Carlson Gracie. I'll mm. tell you why. In 75, Carlson Gracie is by far the leading force in jiu-jitsu in Brazil. He is he has a role inside the federation. He has he is by far the most experienced fighter in the family as far as Valetudo goes. I think he's assimilating his Valetudo into the jiu-jitsu rule set. His Valetudo experience into the rule set. Mm. Because I don't think I think it's odd that they would take let's say the separation from judo starts in 1930, okay? 30 to 75 is 45 years. It takes them 45 years to have the specificity of ground fighting. 45 years. Why did it take so long? And they don't have a specific ground-oriented game. In 75, all of a sudden, between 67 and 75, this revolutionary change in the rule set that shaped the practice that we have today that made jiu-jitsu specific to the ground and this isn't this is in tune with helio grace's own fights i mean you watch helio's fights he doesn't pull guard he's standing up the whole time watch yeah. him with kato watch him with kimura i mean he got taken down 32 times by yasuichi ono how do you get taken down 32 times in a fight unless you're trying to stand up the whole time you're clearly not pulling guard right right i mean if you're pulling guard how do you get taken down 32 times you got taken down 32 times because you're trying to stand up okay and for 45 years, there's no ground orientation in their jiu-jitsu. And in 75, that changes. I can't prove it, but I think that that has to do with – and could that combine with the influence of Vali Tudo in the rule set? Mm -hmm. I have strong reasons to suspect that it's because of Carlson. Um, yeah. Cool. So another question I have about Carlson's changes because – the, the 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 rule set you're talking about for any of you guys that get the book if you go back and look at it it's like it's interesting because you get this like sort of proto rule set to what we have now yeah. um in the book rosado talks about and says that he never saw carlson teaching the men self-defense um instead basically he always focused on fighting hard training than the the i don't know if you say correctly taparea taparea yeah Tapadilla, Tapadilla. Okay, the the slap fighting basically where yeah. we do it, which we I remember doing that back when I was like a white belt when I started back in 03. Um, so my question is because again, I have my own thoughts on some of the old like self defense stuff and how effective or even realistic it is. Mm. Uh, but it seems like Carlson started to phase some of that out. Do you think Carlson stopped teaching that self defense to men because he realized the lack of efficacy? I think so. I think again, Car and I and I have I. I'm, Originally, I was starting the book with Carlson. I have three preceding, three or four preceding chapters that trace the, the circus to judo, to the influence of Valitudo, to their new jiu-jitsu slash judo, right? And I did that because I wanted to show that there was a history that preceded Carlson that was directly linked to the circus and then Valitudo. Carlson grew up in that world. That's the world he grew up in. 
Valitudo, not sport jujitsu. There was no, there were no competitions at the time. He has very little, very few jujitsu matches in his career. Most of his experience came from Valitudo. I think that anyone who stepped in the cage and looks, and I don't mean to offend here, I don't mean to attack anyone to each their own, but I'm going to speak my mind. I think anyone that sees a lot of self-defense moves out there, not just in jiu-jitsu curriculum, but most martial arts, looks at anyone who knows anything about fighting and goes, that's not going to work in a fight. You know, I mean, people should train as they wish, but there's a lot of stuff in this curriculum. I mean, anyone who has fought is going to look at that and go, that doesn't work. This is what works. Right hand, left hook, double leg, single leg, rear naked choke, right? Twisting someone's wrist in the middle of a fight is ludicrous. Unless you're fighting <laughs> unless unless you're fighting a five year old, you know, like well, everyone's gets a child, maybe, but well, that's the thing too. Like you, you everybody's got phones now. So like you see what like street fights actually look like because you people's yeah. recording and nobody like comes up and grabs the guy by the shirt and says, Hey buddy, and, and sits there for like 10 seconds <laughs> while the guy grabs his wrist. I mean, fights typically you watch people, they blade a little bit with their upper bodies, they turn a certain point, they prepare themselves, and then immediately they just start swinging and going after each other, and then they clinch up and then it, they either stay on the feet somehow or they get taken down. I mean, it's pretty it's pretty repetitive. You see why a lot of these systems got away with it so long. It just hit the nail on the head because of cameras. Because people mm -hmm. didn't know. If you, In the mm -hmm. 1940s, if you claim to be a black belt and an expert and you said, this is what works in a fight, everyone's going to believe you. They have no point of reference. They don't have the UFC. You understand? Even in like throughout most of history, the martial, like martial arts, 70s, 80s, I mean, we believe Van Damme. We believe Bruce Lee. We, mm -hmm. We're looking at that stuff, you know, and I'm like, that stuff works in a fight. And you watch a real fight, and it goes, wait a second, where are those spinning kicks? Mm -hmm. Why doesn't that stuff work, right? And then I think a lot of, I mean, it can work. It could potentially work. But mm -hmm. let's talk about the stuff that works consistently. Jab, right hand, left hook, single leg, double leg, rear naked choke, Kimura. Like, it's, it's like half a dozen things that work consistently. And I think Carlson understood that, and he wanted to put a hyper focus on the things that worked in a fight. and weed out a lot of the things that wouldn't and to put it to the test it says let's roll live if we roll live we automatically create a selection process that weeds out the nonsensical and ineffective and puts a hyper focus on the effective he created the evolutionary track that led not only to modern mma but also modern brazilian jiu-jitsu even though modern brazilian jiu-jitsu i'm very sure he'd be critical of you know i don't think anyone could have foreseen all the consequences of a lapel no one could think that far ahead, but <laughs> I'm pretty confident he would be against it. Yeah. You know? hmm. What's your so let's look at like rule sets now. Do you have in your idea, and this is kind of a multi-part question, what's like your ideal version of jujitsu, maybe techniques or even how to train, and then a tournament or like a rule set that would be, you know, ideal to to show that. I wrote a um three articles for gtr about a year ago um maybe just over a year ago one was you know the things i liked and disliked about ibjjf the things i liked and disliked about adcc and the things i liked and disliked about submission only there's not a lot about submission only i like i'm going to say that right now like i because i think it removes the control aspect of the fight and it puts this hyper focus on submission and it makes it very similar to catch wrestling and i don't want to you know catch wrestling has its place in history but I think it one of the mistakes they made was emphasize submission and not emphasize position. Mm -hmm. And I think that creates a problem. I think one reason why Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu practitioners have been so dominant on the ground is because there's this emphasis on positioning, right? Mm -hmm. Passing guard, controlling the pass, controlling the back, getting to the back, staying in there. And I think submission only kind of removes a lot of that of the equation because it doesn't reward you for taking someone down and holding them down. Right. But going back to your question, um, I don't think there's anything out there. I have my own rule set that I created. I run my own local tournaments here, and I added punches to jujitsu. Okay. Um, but the punches aren't to the face. They're next to the head. Just like we did when we trained MMA back in the day, you didn't punch the guy in the head with gloves, but you punched the ground right next to his head. Okay. And I, I award points for that, right? So you, you don't in that rule set, you don't want to sit in the deep half guard. <laughs> you don't want to sit there. I mean, if you do, you got to go quick because if someone keeps punching next to your ear, they're going to be scoring points. You know, and it's just adding strikes to jujitsu to remind people, much like Taparia did, that you can't do this in a fight. There's a reason why the reason why people didn't evolve shin to shin guard in Brazil in the 80s. It's not because they're stupid. You know, a lot of people think, oh, the leg locks, you know, we innovated them. You know, all oh, those people couldn't do it. They're too, they're too dumb to do it. I was like, no, you get slapped in the ear if you did that. 
it's 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 nonsensical to set up shin to shin when slaps are involved. There's a reason why no one does it in the UFC. You know, in the UFC, how do you play guard with your back on the ground and your feet up in the air? That's where the term guard comes from. You're guarding your head from punches with your legs. That's where the term guard comes from, not from a shin to shin or a deep half, right? And I think we, I mean, we're so removed from the reality of combat that we kind of forgot about the origin of the term guard and what it's for. But I think a, a system that is meant to teach you how to fight needs to take in consideration that much of what we're teaching, I include myself here, wouldn't work in a fight, you know? And I think we're, we kind of don't care anymore, really. But mm -hmm. I think it's important for terms of longevity and credibility and in order for us not to completely become what we once criticized. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting because that was the thing that when I like when I first started jujitsu and obviously before me, but I remember that was always the thing that we would uh, we would like bite down on is saying, well, you know, the stuff that you guys are doing in Taekwondo or karate or whatever the traditional martial art was, yeah. that wouldn't work in a fight. That yeah. was always our our thing, right? We we because we could look back at jujitsu and say, hey, this this works in a fight. Like, we can pull guard and get close or whatever. And the jujitsu is pretty simplistic. And where you look at a lot of the sports stuff that we all play around with now. Like, I mean, I fought MMA, you fought MMA. So like a lot of us kind of, we kind of know, like we know what the basics are and we know how to get back to that fighting jujitsu. Yeah. But I think some people maybe don't because they haven't been exposed to yeah. those sorts of things. But it is yeah. interesting to see that the jujitsu has gone in a direction where a lot of the stuff that we do now would have yeah. no place in a fight. And, and, and we don't seem to care. I mean, when I started training, I mean, <clears throat> you, you mentioned you trained Top Buddy in 2003. That's very late. The last time I did it was 98. And I thought I was one of the last ones to experience that. in 2003. That's man. That's I've never even heard of that. We but, couldn't get a hold. Of, we couldn't get a hold of gloves, right? So like gloves were hard to get a hold of. Like you yeah. know, back in the day when I first started, you just couldn't. They didn't have like every different glove available. You would have to get on some random website to get a glove. Or we used to take the Harbinger gloves and yeah. you'd cut out the little bar. Yes. And yes. then you would, you know, the, the ones that take Abbott would wear back in the day. And so you'd yeah. fight with those. And so that a lot of times the slap was just, we could slap each other just a little bit to like, hey, you just got yeah. hit in the face. Yeah. And so it was a way to kind of work around that. But yeah, no, so I'm, I'm from that. I mean, I'm, we're okay. I guess, I guess you two were part of the generation where Jiu Jitsu was meant to work in a fight. I mean, jiu-jitsu, when I started training, it was the same thing as volitudo slash MMA. Like, there's jiu-jitsu was preparation for MMA. That's mm -hmm. what jiu-jitsu was. Jiu-jitsu was not preparation for IBJJF or ADCC. Jiu-jitsu was mm -hmm. preparation for a fight. Now, the sports have grown so much in different directions. I have students that train jiu-jitsu and couldn't care less about what's going on on flow grappling. And then I have students that train jiu-jitsu and couldn't care less about what's going on in the UFC. Right. They're just like completely different kinds of jujitsu. And as an instructor, I'm kind of split because I'm teaching two separate classes, all two different methods, really, because there's jujitsu for a fight and there's jujitsu for sport. And I mean, I, I I don't like to teach lapel guard, I'll be honest with you. Like it's not rocket science. It's like, oh, I can't figure that out. I'm like, I'm pretty sure if I sit down there, I can learn it. Like I know like maybe two or three things from there. And I'm even hesitant to teach it because it's so removed from the reality I'm a fan of the fight. Well. I must I must like this is I mean, it's kind of like, I, I see, I had a t-shirt made, everyone thought it was a bad idea, maybe you guys will think it's a good idea, but the t-shirt was like, I, had it, I actually had it made, it says, um, lapel guards and butt scooting are the new nunchucks, prove me wrong, <laughs> <laughs> you know? And it, I mean, it, it is, it's a very yeah. specific thing that we do that yeah. has no application anywhere else. Yeah. And I think that because when you're immersed in something, you don't, it's like a fish in water. You don't see water. It's just, it's your reality. Mm -hmm. But I do, and I, and I don't mean to, you know, attack anyone. I just, you know, I don't want to offend anyone. I got to keep saying this. People get offended by everything these days. Yeah. But like, I, I think that it's just going to be an embarrassment in the future. Like, I think 50 years, 100 years from now, like, you know, people are going to look at this and go, man, what does, what is the point of that? You know, and there's so many great things about, you know, jiu -jitsu, realistic jujitsu. When I see Khabib, I see a great representative of old school jujitsu. I hate to use the term old school because it's associated with things that, you know, I don't care about old or new. I care about if it working. But he's he's a great representative of Carlson Grace's mindset. Like punch, punch, takedown, ground and pound submission. Like he's probably the best representative of that sort of mentality. Sure, he comes from Sambo, but he's fighting exactly how these guys used to train or how they used to prepare for it for a fight back in the day whereas today i we're very underrepresented in mma because we've gone in a very different direction which 
has its positives. It open. I mean, your your mom might want to train jujitsu today because there are no slaps. But if you include slaps, mom and dad are probably going to go screw that. Yeah, you know, like I don't want my kids doing that. Like you, 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 the Spartans. They they that you weed out the Spartans. They go do in the May, and you democratize it to a much broader audience. And and that's kind of where we're at now. And it made my life as comfortable. I'm an awful businessman, and I still make a good living just because Joe Rogan sends me a new student every day. Not a day goes by that I don't get a new student through the door thanks to Joe Rogan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I joke in the book that uh, Joe Rogan is our Elvis Presley. I don't yeah. know if you guys caught that. Yep. Because like, yep. the, yeah. he, did, he did for us what Elvis did for karate, you know. And, um, but, like, and it's great, you know, because of that. I make a comfortable living. But I'm not going to lie. There's, there's a conflict there that I, I feel like mm -hmm. I live because – I, you know, I, the reason why I love, I fell in love with jujitsu was not because I couldn't make money from it. I fell in right. love with jujitsu because, you know, there was, there were values that came with it. There were tough love values that have vanished. Mm -hmm. I mean, the idea of self-promotion, that was an embarrassment. I'm not that old. Man. I've been doing this for 25 years, but it was, an, it was embarrassing to self-promote. Like the idea of bragging, the idea of like blaming your coach for losing. I get blamed. My students lose matches. Like people get mad at me. Like it's my fault. I'm like, dude blaming the referee blaming this like there was accountability it was like this tough love culture of don't be a whiny bitch mm -hmm. i had, i like that about jiu-jitsu it was real like you had to take care of you cosado says that you got to toughen up and if you care not fit for the environment pack your bag and leave right and I, and you can't do that anymore because you're running a business so you you you, you, you if you did that you go out of business so it's a conflict yeah. But do you think you can still, because I mean, that's something I think about, because I was reading the book and, um, you know, there were parts of where you were talking about like phasing out like the gauntlet and stuff like that. Like I still do the gauntlet. Um, yeah. We're like, we're like, whatever, we're still going to do it. Um, and I think about like creating spaces for certain people, like with like the business side of it, right? Like we've got a pretty big gym. It's around like 600 yeah. people. Um, and so like we try to give that's boxing and, you know, MMA and stuff as well, but we try to give people spaces, right? So like you have your, your space where like you guys are, because again, like it, when we talk about like a lot of the older people that train now, or even guys that are like, as we get older, like, you know, you think about like the stories that were coming out of Carlson, uh, Gracie seniors gym, right? Like they're just animals, just young guys killing each other every day. And like, as we get older, we probably wouldn't be able to do it. I think you were talking to, uh, I, I don't know how to say his name. Sarima. City Emma. Yeah. Yeah. He was talking about like, man, like I got a, a bad, mad, bad neck or bad back. I couldn't train like that. Right. But I can train in these capacities. Yeah. But then also like at the gym, we also have people that are like the young fighters, like all these yeah. guys that are fighting and they're just getting after it uh, or the people that are going to do those certain things and you can give them spaces. Do you think it's possible to balance it in some way where, yeah, you can give people this sporty jujitsu and you can let them have that space or that space where they can train and enjoy it even as they get older. But then you can also have that space where, and this will be for our like special forces, our Spartans, our guys that really just want to get after it. And there's the space, there's the class times for them. And those are the guys that are going to be like our fighters. Yes. I, I think we do balance it. You know, I mean, ideally, if you have a lot of students, you can have a class for each one of these groups and train them separately. Like that would be ideal. And I think that the best solution is to, I mean, I'm not going to send my mom's home. Like I want them training. Even if they're not elite <laughs> athletes, you know, I, it improves right. on them. If right. they're 1% better after a year of training, like I'll take that progress, you know, mm -hmm. um, as long as we're upholding them to high standards. And I, sure. I worry that the standards are being dropped in the name of quick money. And I mm -hmm. see this a lot. That's what bothers me. I, I they call it prof professionalization. I, I call it prostitution. Um, there's a lot of that going on in the sport, you know, people selling out and people just, I mean, I, I'm very, I have my differences with the IBJJF. I think just sure. things about the rules. Like I mentioned lapel guard. I hate it. I think it's dumb, but I mean, you gotta be very thankful for the IBJJF because had they not stepped in and set standards, man, this would have been a complete circus by now. Cause I remember not too long ago, if you guys remember this, people were promoting children. They were getting their black belts after two years. There were people advertising promoting your black belt in three years. It was becoming like it was a thing. Oh, that was just, a, that was like there was a there were books coming out there. Like, here's yeah. the secret to getting your black belt in yeah. three to five years. I'm like, like why would yeah. you want it so fast? I never because, understood that one. Because people want easy things. They want they want that the, the notoriety. They want the status. They want the prestige. But they don't want a, the arthritis. Are you kidding me, man? You want the arthritis? Yeah. Who wants that? You know, but if it were not for IBJJF, right, stepping in and creating systems and standards in time, because these things didn't exist before them, 
Even in the 90s in Brazil, as late as the 90s, early 2000s, they still didn't exist. They're fairly new developments in Jiu Jitsu, and that's thanks to them. You know, and I don't think I don't think people fully appreciate what that means for our credibility because if if, if you have twelve year old black belts out there, you know, like and no one, you know, everyone's a black. I mean, shit. Then you can do. I'm gonna sell my black belts on Amazon. Then you know. Well, right, and that's the way the way we look at black belt is different than some martial arts, right? Because some martial arts look at the black belt as a like competency, whereas we're like, this is like a, a this is like essentially like you're a ma like a master of what we're doing on some level, or you are a, in a teaching position. You're like someone that can be looked up to, not just you have some level of competency. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's, I mean, but it's it's generally speaking, like if I said I got a black belt in four years, you'd be like, whoa, that was fast, right? Yeah. Like yep. it's not supposed to be that fast. I mean, there are people. Like my my ex wife Michelle, she got a black belt in three to four years, winning a world title at every level. She won she, a world title rare. blue, yeah. blue, purple, brown, and black. Oh, she got a black belt in four years. Well, hey, she won a world title in every single mm -hmm. one of those belts. What are you gonna do? You gonna stop her? Yeah. Like BJ got it in three four years, but same thing. He got a he won. He was a brown belt for like six months, and he won a world title as a black belt. Like, what are you gonna, how are you gonna criticize? You can't argue with success. But those are the exceptions, right? People mm -hmm. don't realize that. Like. People try to market the exceptions if that were the reality of the discussion. It's like we're talking about the zero point zero one percent, you know. And I, I and I not only that, but like I think the a lot of the the the, the with with the commercialization of jujitsu, the democratization, the popularization, you're gonna get all of this growth, and it's almost impossible for the product not to be watered down to some degree, you mm -hmm. know, because the more people you bring, the more financial pressure you're going to have on the martial art for it to become like easier you see what i'm saying not just the belts i'm talking about the practice i'll give an example when i started training practice were two to three hours long that was normal yeah. and if you were on the mat for less than two hours you're a bitch like that simple like it, we started at 6 p.m we will till 9 p.m every day religiously it was a three-hour practice and then it was 90 minutes and then it, my gym's like an hour because most people don't want to do 90 minutes. They want to do an hour. And I'm seeing gyms that are doing 45 minutes now. And I'm not saying, okay, to each their own, it's a better it's a better business model, really, for business purposes. 45 is better than an hour. An hour is better than an hour and a half. But I think if we keep going that route, like you see what's happening, I there's no way you can get a workout that you need in 30 minutes, 20 no minutes. I mean, that's, that's enough time to warm up. In wrestling, that's not even the warm up. You know, and, and this is why I think Brazilian Jiu Jitsu should probably copy some from. I mean, wrestling is the purest, in my opinion. Wrestling, methodology wise, it's like they're, it's unmatched because probably because there's no money. Probably because there's no money in wrestling. That's why it's remained pure over the years because they're able to maintain a Spartan practice daily. And I mean, look at the results. Like, we in, practically invented MMA, Jiu Jitsu. How many MMA fighters? Have come MMA champ UFC champions have come out of Jiu Jitsu in the last 20 years? Not that many. How many have come out of the NCAA circuit? Half the UFC champions have come from the NCAA circuit. Like, who are we kidding here? Mm -hmm. You know, who I mean, I don't like to admit this, but the truth is the truth. You know, like they're doing something right. And I, I think that technically wrestling is far less sophisticated than Jiu Jitsu. It's simple, but that might be its strength. It's so simple. Get on top, stay on top. Right, you know where we. I mean, try to do a take. If I say every every Wednesday it's takedown day in my gym, half my students don't show up. <laughs> you know, yeah. so it's tough. Takedown. I mean, wrestling's very tough. It's, it's very yeah. like the pace, the intensity, and I think you know, like when you look at Carlson's gym, the the intensity of training that yeah. that kind of what's what creates that, and that's not for everybody, right? It's not for that, everyone. Yeah. That intensity can can set people apart you have some people that can stay in there and and then you have those elite kind of higher level athletes versus you know you have the moms or the or the older you know people getting into it that maybe can't handle the intensity of training that, that type yeah. of, of style and, and, so. and you're right and it's a conflict because you can't you can't have it both ways like if you right. if you crank the volume up you're going to have a small group of people if you yeah. crank the volume down you're going to have a bigger group of people right, right. but then you're going to make more money too but the quality is going to go down so there, you, you, there's, there's, you have these conflicts in martial arts, right? And some of them don't have an absolute solution. You have a tentative, harmonious like solution of mm -hmm. having two separate classes, different environments, different days. You can, you can work around, separate people. But again, if we're doing that too much, what is jujitsu? 
And then yeah. you have you have a fall of problem of definition. Like, you know, it's it's they're not they're not there's no easy solution. Like, I'm not pretending that I have solution to these things. I don't. But I, I think that it just acknowledging the problem and just like hopefully starting a discussion is, I think it's healthy. And I mean, at least it's interesting to me. At least you know, I I like thinking about these things. What's your do you think your standards for black belt? Like, let's start with saying, what are your kind of standards? Some some basic ideas of what you look for in a black belt to get promoted um, under you, and also has that standard changed over the years? You know, as jujitsu has grown. I it's a very good question. I I have people I, I regret promoting because I think I, you know, it's I I I range I think character is one, not just mm -hmm. attendance, technique, results, consistency, all these things. You know, mm -hmm. like. My standards have changed over the years. I've gone from really harsh to too easy and then back to harsh. You know, like it's it's constantly changing. And a black belt is a green light to teach, you know, and even less. Even the purple belt could technically be teaching. So, you know, I, I think that there should be some some level of standards. And IB, IBJJF kind of lets it to the instructors, the schools, and I – I would like them to step in a little more. I wish they they actually had a little more, acted more like the Koto Khan it does for judo and at, with more authority. I think that in the long run, it'd be good for jujitsu. It's like you can't force people to do things, but if you gave people guidelines, I think a lot of people would follow, like a central curriculum, like a central canon of what jujitsu is. Define it so it's not because i have my white belts that want to learn a boogie choke but don't care about an armbar from close guard yeah and if i argue with them oh my coach is old school he's trying to hold me back look at this video <laughs> there's a million views here for yeah. this boogie choke clearly it's superior to the armbar from close guard and no matter how much you argue with your student he sees a million clicks on this video and he sees your lonely voice over here clearly you're wrong robert you don't know what you're talking about the people have spoken they're right so there's no order to things like and, and instructors and i talk to instructors all over the world and they all have this problem everyone every coach has the same problem we don't know what to teach because if you give the student what he needs you might lose some students if you give him what he wants you're compromising his learning process right and there's like i think that have agreeing on what some of the 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 main core techniques are for ground grappling right would actually go a long way and just creating some systems and some a little more structure i think you know because i don't think you can force people to do things but i think the sport would benefit from a little more direction because um it's out in the open right now it's like everyone mm -hmm. does whatever they want and i think that i think that hurts jujitsu it's very chaotic too in terms of like how people teach like no one we don't agree on what the what the central techniques of jujitsu are but I think statistics would do a long, long way to solve that problem. I've suggested, like I've said this a million times, like man, someone needs to sit down and do statistics on jujitsu so we narrow down what's happening and then we have a good idea of what those central techniques are because they are the more common ones and then your white belt can't argue with you. The single fact, the fact that a white belt would argue with you is already a lot, but they're not arguing with you like explicitly, but they're arguing with you in their head because they're not believing you. Mm -hmm. You know, your blue belt doesn't believe you because he wants to learn to boogie choke. But if you show the statistics to him, it's like, listen, man, this is what, and you had it on the wall. It's like, okay, let, now we, it is obvious that these are the central techniques of what we call Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. You know, I know there's been some bean counters that have gotten together um, for different competitions like Worlds and stuff like that, and basically made charts of like which submissions made up how many submissions of the actual competition, as an example. Yeah. Um, not all techniques, but just the submissions. And you, you know, again, you find that the number of one submissions or things like, you know, for instance, like if you're talking about like a choke, like a bone arrow choke, it's probably one of the most powerful chokes in the gi. Yeah. Um, you know, then you see things like with the rear naked choke and arm bar. I mean, it's all the basic stuff. And then there's these little slivers of, you know, some random thing that someone got caught in that a yeah. person knows how to use. But it's usually, I mean, when you, when you get down to it, the more you watch competitions and stuff like that, even when guys do kind of crazy sweeps or whatever, the submissions tend to be most of the time. And most of the techniques tend to be fairly straightforward stuff yeah, and and i have a chapter about this in the book like you know like what should lead jujitsu's evolution sophisticated and entertaining or simple and efficient and i going back i use wrestling again as an example i use the example of boxing like boxing weeded out like you can think of a hundred different ways of punching someone but boxing kind of fit, like centered their cannon around like four or five punches 
wrestling, I'm sure that a whole complete wrestling book of techniques would be hundreds of takedowns. Mm-hmm. But I mean, if you ask any good wrestler, they're going to tell you, yeah, it comes down to single, double, ankle pick, fireman's carry. There's like five or six moves that are actually working consistently in wrestling. But when it comes to jujitsu, it's that we have this obsession with novelty and variety that I think does more harm than good. I think we should have a, a, a central kind of like maybe, shit, make it 20 techniques. And let's, this is what stuff, and I don't care if it's old or new, it doesn't matter. But these are the things that are working consistently. And you're right, they're normally simple and they're very consistent. Bow and arrow is a prime example. Rear naked choke, armbar, kimura, guillotine, right? But it's not, okay. and, and it's kind of common sense that these are the best ones, but it's not written down. The problem when you don't write something down, you don't, you don't make it a code, right? is that future generations might get, especially beginners, they get confused as to what's what. And then all of a sudden the boogie chokes and the lapel guards make it in there, but the armbar from closed guard doesn't because perception becomes reality. Like fashion and internet algorithms go on to shape what people perceive the right thing or the best thing to be. Here's a question for you, and this is more for you because I'm always interested in talking to guys like you who've had a long road with this stuff. Um, What is your training like these days? Um, cause obviously, you know, we'll get back to the book, but I'm curious about you as a person, like, you know, how old are you now, Robert? 42, just 42, turned 42. Right. And you, and, and again, you're not like, you're not a super old guy, but you know, you, uh, you've got a lot of mileage <laughs> on you, right? Like jujitsu puts a few miles on you, especially when you're competing at a level that you yeah. were doing for a while. What is your training regimen like now? Like how do you mix in your own training and still being able to do consistently with all your teaching? I, uh, I call myself like a rental car. I'm not that old. I just got a lot of miles. <laughs> you, you, get, you get a, you get a, I got 2021 with like, you got road rough for a while, 150,000 miles on it. Like that's me. You know, I have arthritis, uh, on my neck and lower back, two herniated discs on the neck, one on the lower back. I have arthritis on both of my wrists, which is the most, the worst of them all. I can barely hand fight. I got arthritis on both my knees. I can't go to war. I can train. I cannot go to war. If I, the last time I went to war, I said, fuck it, I'm going to go through with this freaking naked choke and I don't care how much it hurts. I went to bed at 4 a.m. because my wrists were just like, and I was in so much pain, throbbing, that I there was no position I would put my hand in where they wouldn't throb. Like I, It was like I went to bed at 4 a.m. unable to sleep in so much pain. And it's arthritis, so there's not a lot you can do. And I'm 42, so it's going to get worse. So I my goal at this stage of my life is to train every day a little bit or as much as i can without going to war just you know i have some students that need hard work so i do my best but i basically train like i have boxing gloves on i can't really hand fight anymore um and but i try to get in at least like three four times a week i just don't go to war anymore and that's and that's hard because that's what i like the most about jujitsu like i sure. trained like an idiot in my 20s like i was of like every every match was a final of the world championship like every sweep counted like there was a world title on the line. And I think that's wrong at this point in my life. I think that you have to be like that, but kind of know when to rest more, eat better, take the foot off the pedal a little bit, you know, and I didn't do that at all in my twenties. I, I, I was, it was the intensity and the lack of this, the rest, all of that was very, you know, it was kind of almost self-destructive. Do you think it was necessary? Like, though, I mean, for you to achieve, you know, ADCC champion, like for what you have achieved, do you think it was necessary to train that way? Or is there a smarter way to do it? You know, when I, (laughs) depends who you're asking. (laughs) Like, the now, Rob, I'm not sure it was worth it. I remember, like, I spoke to a black belt. He would have been 50 years old, and I was like 16. I was just getting started, right? I was one of the first black belt I ever met in Brazil. And he said, man, watch your health, be careful with your body. Be careful with your body. And I'm like, shut up, old man. I didn't say it, but I'm like, I'm thinking in my head. Thinking I'm, it, yeah. yeah, I'm like, I'm Wolverine, you know, like nothing's ever going to happen to me, yeah. you know. And then now I'm in like, I'm 42 and I kind of get where he's coming from. Is it worth it? I wouldn't regret. I don't regret it. Like I would do it all over again. I would have been smarter about recovery, diet. And like, for example, not like knowing when to lose. Like sometimes like I was so, I don't know if it's an ego thing or just my competitive nature. I'd get caught in something and I want to tap. Like I would risk injury on myself and my training partners not to have a point scored on me in practice. Well, that's stupid. Now, if you do that in a tournament, yes, that's that makes perfect sense that you would risk injury. But to risk injury on yourself and your training partners over two points that 
no one's counting. Yeah. Like, you know, it, I don't know. Like, maybe that was too much. You know, like I would have maybe no win to lose because like a lot of people train like that. You can be successful and not be an egomaniac on the mats. You know, and I, I think there was a little bit of that in me, in, in the sense where I just had to win every single round. And I think like, but you know, also too, I think it's something where as we've gotten older and getting a little more intelligent, you can undulate the, uh, the sort of intensity from different periods of time, because, you know, if you just enjoy doing something, sometimes it's hard to give it a season. Like, you know, like a lot of sports have seasons. So you yeah. have this really hard intensity for a short period of time. And then it goes back yeah. to some sort of like lowering, like I have college wrestlers that like they would go for their summer and they wouldn't even wrestle. They would just drill. Yeah. Um, and he would work out and then when season was getting, then he'd start doing a lot more live wrestling. Yeah. And with us, it's just like, we wanted to beat the crap out of each other. And that's yeah. what it was. It's, it's because it's fun. Like wrestlers have something we don't, which is this little thing called discipline. <laughs> you know, like we don't, I don't, I, I have, I mean, people say discipline, oh, train every day, but I love training every day. You like training. I, yeah. I can't call it discipline. I hated drilling. You couldn't get me to drill. I mean, you yeah. have to like put a gun to my head to get me to drill. I hated it. I wanted to go live. You know, and I think this is the reason I think it's the, the difference is in wrestling, there's a lot more impact going live would accelerate aging even more than jujitsu. Sure. Know? But I think that they judo and wrestling, they make up for that by insisting on the repetition that it's controlled where you're still getting the workout, but not the stress on the joints because you're controlling the impact. Mm -hmm. So you're really going live 20% of the time you're drilling 80 Whereas in jiu-jitsu, it's more like 90% of the time we're going live and 10%. We do the move like four or five times and we call it drill. And it's like, you know, I, I think <laughs> and, and it's, it's not. I mean, and it's the other thing too, it's, it's hard to drill on the ground. It's like drilling takedowns makes, it's a lot easier to do. The easier in the sense of like, it's okay, a double leg, it's easy to practice that move a hundred times. And in the sense where there's resistance, you know what to do. But when it comes to like, an arm bar from closed guard, it's hard to mimic that same level of resistance that you would get someone. You know, it's like if the guy's letting you completely, you're not really learning. If he's resisting just a little bit, I think things dramatically. Mm -hmm. I think it's methodologically speaking, harder to drill on the ground than it is standing. I don't know if mm -hmm. that makes any sense. No, I, I could see that it, it would be different. Like you can, you can more easily do a repetition of like a takedown where you're going in and getting your reps opposed to maybe going through and doing a really slow grindy, you know, quarter mount to mount like pass where you're prying your leg out and you're driving your face across. You can't yeah. do that as like swift and as smoothly as a double leg takedown. It's something that takes a little bit longer and. Um, there's also a, you know, it, it's just a different situation. Yeah. I think that the ground has less, it's more positional, it's more weight distribution. And I think it's harder to mimic some of these things than it is to mimic like a jab in a right hand, for example, which you can practice on a heavy bag your whole life and still be improving on it. Like, I think that a lot of ground grappling involves a lot of like anticipation. It's, it's just harder to drill. I think intelligent drilling is you can ask training partners to give you the right amount of resistance. And if they do that, it's approximate, but it's just a little bit harder as a teacher, as a I try to get my students to do it. And they, they end up like, like wet noodle on the ground and the yep. guy passes their guard of like nothing was learned. You know, if the guy's not fighting back, like nothing is learned. You know, in wrestling, they're taught how to sprawl a little bit so you get a reward out of that takedown. And it makes sense when you go live because it's teaching you what resistance looks like. Or maybe it's just not part of the culture and the jujitsu practice that way. I have a hard time getting my students to do that. I teach it every day, and it's like an uphill battle to teach the uki to resist, you know. Yeah, I think it's part of being a good training partner is uh, providing the correct or, you know, similar yeah. looks. And that's... Yes. It also comes with experience, right? To know what to do and kind of doing that some capacity to where, because you can overdo it and make it a very difficult process where you don't yeah. get the reps. It's a lot of effort versus, you know, not giving them anything realistic. And then yeah. it's just like, it, but, but it you know what? Work. But I spoke to wrestlers before and they said that it's very hard to teach that in wrestling. Like when you're a kid, they spend like the first few years teaching people how to be good drilling partners. Mm. It's not something that comes automatically in wrestling. So it's just something that doesn't happen overnight it might be a long process for people to learn how to give you the right feel, you know, and mm -hmm. you just got to be more patient maybe, but jujitsu is very young compared to wrestling. So, you know, we're still learning these things for sure. Yeah. Well, I got, I got one more Chewy. Go I got one more question. Um, so, and this is actually a question Chewy. So credit to him. So in the book, you said you have a personal preference, uh, or whatever shape jujitsu takes to move forward. It should be steered towards the reality of combat while still evolving in a competitive format. So what is, 
you know, I'll, I'll, I'll make it into two parts. First of all, what would you love to see jujitsu kind of progress towards and where do you envision it in reality going to? I think the, the home run, I mean, people may not agree with me, but the home run would be that every single UFC champion, one champion, PFL champion, Bellator champion had a background in jujitsu, you know? And I think that right now wrestling has taken that place. It's the, the majority of them come from wrestling, you know? Um, wrestling is a traditional rival of jujitsu, but I think that in terms of MMA, they've outdone us by a lot. And you can always say, oh, but they're learning jiu-jitsu. Yeah, just, but they're also learning boxing. And mm -hmm. the boxers are learning wrestling. And the kickboxers are learning jiu-jitsu. Everybody's learning everything. But as far as, like, the foundation, there's not – part of it is because jiu-jitsu has become so popular, you know. And I think that we're treading in the path of judo. I think we'll become the new judo. I think judo's on its way. I don't want to say this, but people will be mad. There's so many people doing judo around the world. But, man, I'll, you don't see a lot of people leaving Brazilian jiu-jitsu to go for judo or wrestling. You see people going from wrestling and judo to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu all the time because they there's more, get older. It, there's longevity, and that's the yeah. IBJJF strategy. And there's a reason. I think they they saw this when their their biggest tournament by far is Masters Worlds yeah. by far, and that's when they clicked. I'm like, man, this is this is our this is where Jiu Jitsu is going. Like I could train until I'm 60 if I if I can keep the pace I'm at now. I'll be on the mats until I'm 60, even with my arthritis. There's no way you can do that in wrestling. With high impact, mm -hmm. like going live with judo, man, it's brutal. Muay Thai, try Muay Thai. Try sparring live Muay Thai every day. It's brutal, man. Mm -hmm. so Even just I taking think, the drills and taking the bumps from the judo and yeah, stuff's rough. It's rough. But getting back up, man, my knees hurt when I stand back up. Man, I don't want to be standing back up all the time. <laughs> you know? like So I think that the, the jiu-jitsu, Brazilian jiu-jitsu will win this fight. They will become the most practiced martial art <laughs> in the world. If it isn't already, we will be... I think that the ambitious project of having like hundreds of millions and you know, over a billion people, it's not, it, we're on that course. We're on that track. I think we're, we haven't peaked yet, but I think, you know, the sacrifice to that is numbers. You know, if you're going to increase numbers, you're going to lose a little bit of quality and we no longer dominate MMA like we used to. Like there was a minute there, if you're a jiu-jitsu black belt, like people were terrified of fighting you. There's a, you have, you were by far the favorite, you know, it was a brief moment, but it did. It was real. If, even though the jiu-jitsu population was very small in comparison to other martial arts, we still dominated. Today, the jiu-jitsu population is enormous, but we don't. We're not the most dominant martial art in the world in the ring. I don't think so. Yeah. And then, uh, so brother, so I appreciate you being here with us. Tell the people um, that are listening one where they can find you, and also two, tell us um, where they can uh, where they can pick up the book. Um. I'm, I'm not, the only social media I use is uh, Instagram. Like I can't do all the platforms. There's way too many. I don't have that much time for social media. So you can message me on, uh, at Robert Drysdale, JJ. Um, I'm pretty active there. Um, uh, I teach in Las Vegas. I've been here for 15 years and, uh, anyone is welcome. My gym I'm not very political. You're always welcome to visit for a tournament. You come over for a convention, whatever. Everyone's welcome at the gym. You can buy the book at closedguardfilm.com. They're also available on Amazon. We have the Audible version come out. I didn't realize how popular Audibles were. Mm -hmm. They sell way more than the the printed version. You know, like I didn't have. I was resistant Audible for the longest time because I I like to read paperbacks. Like that's Same. I'm like an old school guy. Um, but I think most people prefer Audible these days. So we have Audible and Kindle as well for both books. We have multiple. We have four languages on the first one, and for now only English and Portuguese on the second one. Um, but yeah, I mean. And if you guys ever stop by in Vegas, uh, I like feedback on the book. Every now and then I'll get someone writing a critical review of the book to me. They'll write me privately, and I love those. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's nice to hear that people loved your book, but I appreciate people disagreeing with me as well and telling me why they think I'm wrong. Like, I don't mind that. Like, a lot of times they'll point to a blind spot. And, um, yeah, man, like it's, it's been a pleasure, man. Like I, I appreciate the time. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for making the book, man. I think uh, if you guys are listening to this and you have not checked it out, I think you should go read it. I think it's a, it's an important thing to uh, to actually get a little bit of an understanding of some of the history that from where we come from. There's so much stuff that like guys like me and like all of us had coming into the sport, what we thought it was and everything else. And it's interesting to see the roots and where it came from um, in, in actually getting, trying to get an, an objective view rather than say like this sort of mythical hero view of, of all these different people and seeing who they were and then seeing where, you know, the, the roots of our, our sport and our martial art came from. 
Yeah, that was the goal. And I, I, you know, I played a part in this, I think. Like, again, there are other people that have done, you know, before me and deeper than me. But I think I might played a role in, like, bringing the story, you know, making even some a little more, shedding more light on it. And and I, I love it, man. Like, I'm very proud of, of, of these books. They're not, there's some things I would have written differently, but in general, I'm, I'm very proud of them. And, and I'm working on a new one already, so. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you if you got anything on the horizon. That's awesome. Can you tell us a little bit about like what the new book is going to be about? So I started one, but I put it on. I kind of finished it, but it's been too hard to edit it. So I put it on hold because I've kind of lost my page. It was like the, the, the mindset behind fighting. Like it was more psychology of fighting. It became very difficult to organize and write. So I put it on hold. I'm currently working on a book that it's like a critique of martial arts. I don't have a title for it yet, but I'm I'm thinking of what is the purpose of a martial art? So I question, you know, martial arts and culture and philosophical terms, particularly judo. You know, I see some things that I'd really like about judo. I see some problems with it in terms of like its philosophy. Um, some problems that Ishiguro Kano himself identified. And I think he's wrestling. You can see there's a conflict he has between the purpose of judo to create a society, you know, a strong a mutual benefit but also reconciling that with uh, a, an Olympic mindset of com competition, you know? So, you know, and, and I'm, I'm just right now, I'm just reading a lot on the history of judo. There's not a lot out there, but whatever I can get my hands on. And then um, some other critiques of some other martial arts, including, you know, Bruce Lee and, and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, things that were, where I think they went right and where they went wrong, basically. Nice dude. Well, good luck with it, man. Uh, I'm excited. If you come out with anything, like let me know i'll i'll definitely snag it um i enjoy the writing style and the stuff that you put out so far so i'm looking forward to it thank you man thank you appreciate it thanks thank robert thanks robert. Tom. thanks guys see you next time all right guys so hopefully you enjoyed that podcast with robert drysdale hopefully you guys learned something interesting and again if you have not checked out the book i encourage you to get it um again if you're a jiu-jitsu if you're a jiu-jitsu person it's in and you want to know more about like how we got to be where we are it's a really interesting read um you know, again, it's I, I I read it pretty quickly, and I end up um, he, like when Robert was talking about Audible and stuff. I, I used to like Audible more than I do now. I like Audible for certain things, like story type stuff. But I honestly, I I, I I as I get into it more and more, I love the actual having either a book that is like a, a paper book that I can hold, or even an uh, an ebook that I'm reading because it's so hard if I have a good part that I want to take notes of. Sure. Because for instance, like with this particular book, I end up taking about, I mean, there's a lot of spacing, but about 20 pages of notes. Mm -hmm. This is like, obviously like snippets from the book. And then also my thoughts on things about 20 pages of notes as I was going through it. And I can't do that with audio. It's, it's good. You know, they, they do say, I think the research says that retention, like yeah. if you're something you're trying to retain or, you know, study or kind of, commit to memory, you know, reading it, like yeah. actually reading it's a better way than just, well, it may not be for everyone, but I think like, because you do have a, a way to kind of like pause, reread the segment, then maybe write it down or take a notes or put some kind. And sometimes I'll try to do that. Like I'll do a uh, voice messages and stuff, but that can get a little yeah. bit you know, difficult to do. Well, also too, I think that the issue too, is you think about like what people are doing when they're doing books, right? Like when you're reading something, yeah. you're, you're, that's it that's all you're doing you can't you can't like really do anything else but read mm -hmm. right we, in the moment you're reading but with like audiobooks we drive our cars we go for walks we're doing other things and again there's certain things that i like i've got like one of the audiobooks that i have i've got like several different audiobooks and s of like ralph waddle emerson's essays and i will listen to those things over and over again and i almost know them by heart because yeah. i listen to them so much but you know again in those can give me some ideas and a lot of times there's different books that I actually I've read and I'll listen to them in audio again, just to kind of go through them. Um, and I know my wife, she actually, she has a, she likes, she likes reading a book and listening to the audio at the same time. Yeah. Like while you're doing it. Yeah. yeah like she's, she, but she like, she's there. Um, and that helps her with like retention. Uh, but again, just as I've gotten older, sometimes I've noticed that like, I've got like all these audio books and like, I can't tell you everything that's going, like that's happening. Sure. I mean, I've had audible since 2009. Mm -hmm. And then I go to like my library and I can like pull out a book. I can tell you all the stuff in there. And I've got like passages that's dog eared and like notes are flapping right, around right. and stuff. And I can tell you what's going on. But anyway, whatever way you like to, to do a book, get the book um, again, because I think it's, it's fascinating stuff. And uh, I'm glad that he took a lot of the, the, de the source material that was in, you know, Portuguese, it was written in Brazil and stuff like that and took it and then gave it to, you know, English speaking, uh, English speaking or English reading audiences so we could dive into it. 
because otherwise we wouldn't be able to it would be accessible to us but the uh, but again a lot of stuff was interesting like for instance like the the fact that like you know in the book they talk about like where acai and all this stuff came from and how it got oh, yeah how it got linked to jiu-jitsu culture because it wasn't like a thing it was like a bunch of the guys from carlson's gym were just buying up all the acai and then it got connected to it yeah um, um it's fascinating a weird you know like an interesting thing to me was like when you look at the um like alias gyms very different population of people different type more affluent mm -hmm. it's more regimented kind of like private classes this and that and then you look at uh carlson his is like you know you got these guys kind of surf culture kind of relaxed environment it's kind of still that way though isn't well, it? well it's relaxed but then you come in it's super intense yeah. that was like interesting to me like how does that like how did that correlate or how did that you know make it a more conducive like training environment because all these guys were kind of laid back surf culture flip-flops kind of thing mm -hmm. they come in they're just trying to rip each other's heads off it's such a such a dynamic there which is interesting to me yeah i think that's like you know there's there's some different ideas on that right like when i think um when you're this is super esoteric stuff but like when you're thinking about with people when you're trying to transform people and build people mm -hmm. up right you to do that in order to forge people you have to have heat yeah Right, you got to be able to apply. Heat. You have to apply intensity on them, but just like metal, right? You also have to have cooling periods for things to actually mm -hmm. form. Yeah, right. You can't just keep applying heat to someone because again, they'll just melt. Right, right. But like you have those periods of heat and cooling, heat and cooling. And I think that because the intensity was so high, the cooling on the off size, right, had See, to be there, right? Because again, yeah. if you came in and it was regimented, you beat the crap out of each other. There was no, there was no valve to relax and you know right. decompress, decompress. Yeah. You know, you it wouldn't have been an enjoyable experience. It'd been right. like just too much. But right. because you have on both sides of it, you can come in, we're relaxed a little bit, we're having fun, we train really hard. There's the heat, and then when we're done, we're all like you know BSing on the mat, hanging sure. out and stuff like that. Yeah. I think that it applies that 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 cooling effect. So after you're done, you can come down from that that hot training, that intense yep. training. Um, but again, it's super interesting, and I think that you, when you look at it, it, it it's not that it's kind of the same. Sure. I mean, it, it when is. you look at a lot of the gyms that that come from that traditional lineage they still kind of hold a lot of that stuff they still do group, they do group classes and stuff right. like that of course and they have their group training and things like that as well um but again they, they have a different philosophy on training um than a lot of us that came from the carlson lineage yeah um, a little bit different but anyways it's fascinating stuff guys and again hope you enjoyed the podcast and again, check out the book, The Rise and Evolution of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu by Rupert Drysdale. And again, guys, if you want to support the podcast, uh, then check out some of our sponsors, Charlotte's Web. You can check them out. They're a premium CBD product. Again, as a, as a person for me, CBD is a part of my recovery routine. You know, just like talking about Robert Drysdale, recovery is important. There's lots of little things that you can do for recovery. Your biggies are going to be sleep and diet and proper undulation of training, giving yourself the time to take days off and rest and everything else, which when you're doing something like jiu-jitsu, it can be super tough because you like doing it. Mm -hmm. um, those are biggies, right? You know, the big, the, the big ones, right? Proper training, sleep, and diet. I mean, those are your big three. And then you get into things like ice baths and different supplementation that you can take in. And again, um, I, I take all kinds of different stuff. I, I'll take my multivitamins and stuff like that. I have, um, you know, sleep supplements that I take. Um, and then one of the supplements that I take right before bed is Charlotte's Web. Uh, and again, I, I believe in it. I think it's a good product and I encourage people to try it out mainly to see how it affects you because everybody's a little bit different with this stuff everybody's endocannabinoid system is a little different just like all just like medicine people's bodies react differently to medicine right we, you and i could take the same medication and we could have different reactions or no reactions and it just mm -hmm. depends uh but i get i encourage people to try it out if you've never tried cbd and again you can go to their website charlottesweb.com and you can save 30 percent right now using the promo code chujitsu 30. Also, thanks to Matt at Epic Roll for supporting the podcast, as he always has. Again, if you guys want to check out his stuff, he's got geese, rash cards, shorts. I mean, anything jiu-jitsu related, you name it, he's got it. Cool designs, um, good quality stuff, and great customer service. You can check him out at epicrollbjj.com, and you'll save 20% off the order with the promo code CHUJITSU20. Also, guys, if you are a man or you know a man who needs to step up their grooming game a little bit or you just want some great products uh, to do that with, again, there's there's something about having good tools. Like, as guys, we like tools, right? Like, yep. guys like nice stuff. Even, like, the first time I ever got, like, a safety razor, it's a great it's a great piece of tool. It's, like, heavy metal. It's, mm -hmm. It feels good, right? Or, the, you know, even, like, I'm not even that big of a 
be like a big of a craftsman, so, so to speak, you know what I mean? But getting like a, a good tool to do a job with, there's something about it. It's like uh, something enjoyable about it. Something enjoyable about it, right? And especially like when you feel like it's sturdy, right? Like when you feel like you get something that's like quality stuff, it feels good. Uh, again, Manscaped has that quality, the quality tools, the quality stuff to do all your grooming stuff. Everything from shaving your balls, shaving your beard and everything in between. And uh, again, you can check them out at manscaped.com. The promo code is jujitsu 20 That'll get you free shipping and 20% off the order, whether you're buying one of their trimmers um, or their shaving uh, products or even their balms, shampoos, body washes, whatever it might be. And again, I've tried all their stuff. I think it smells amazing. Use it almost every day. So check them out at manscaped.com. And guys, if you want to support the podcast uh, as a Patreon member, you can do so by going to our Patreon, patreon.com slash the jiu-jitsu podcast. Again, inexpensive membership will get you access to an exclusive library of content. Um, again, that, you know, helps support the podcast and you get the whole thing. And again, the, the main thing is we'll give you some cool stuff for it. Um, but again, by doing that, you're helping support the podcast coming to your ears every single day or rather every single week. But when you join, you'll get access to a ad free version of the podcast. Everything from seminars and rolling videos of me, you'll get a version of a warm up routine that Eugene put together. Again, if you guys are interested in jujitsu, um, uh, warm ups or cool downs and stretching and things like that stuff's important. Again, it's not fun, it's not sexy, but going back to recovery, having some sort of warm up or cool down routine is really important. Being able to stretch your body, and even when you start to get into this kind of stuff, you start to find how your body responds to certain things, and you start to find that like certain stretches, certain movements seem to work with you really well. Um, and you can even use that as just a start to explore how to do maintenance on your body right mm -hmm. a lot of people they never dive into that whole thing and, and even just learning if you can find a handful of stretches that you can perform before training or after training that seem to do the bulk of the work for your maintenance can be an important thing um and again it's, it doesn't take very long you know 10 to 20 minutes and you can do a lot of a lot of good for yourself and a lot of injury avoidance uh, but again you can get that at patreon.com slash the jiu-jitsu podcast and uh, last but not least, guys, if you want to get my daily email, which again can range from everything from training tips and ideas to books that I'm reading to little little quotes and philosophical passages that I pick up as uh, my, my reading, especially on my Sunday email that I send out. Uh, if you guys want to get that and everything else that I send out through that email, you can do so by going to my website at shujitsu.net slash join. And again, along with getting my daily email, I will send you two free ebooks. One is on developing a jiu-jitsu game plan. One is on breaking through training plateaus using some different training strategies and then you'll also get a video with that um and the last thing guys if you enjoyed the podcast and you're like i'm not buying anything from these sponsors i'm not joining your email list i'm not becoming a patreon member that's cool but if you do enjoy the podcast if you think it's a good listen if you listen to us weekly like many of you do thousands of you do um then again if you wouldn't mind taking the time to give us a thumbs up or a like or a review or whatever it'll take you like it'll take you like three seconds to do right and again that helps us out as a podcast to keep going it also lets us know that you're enjoying it um, so again if you guys listen to it on some particular app that has some sort of rating system where you can give us a good rating or has a way that you can give us a like a thumbs up whatever it might be again that stuff does help the podcast and we would appreciate it and it's a small thing you can do if you want to support it but again anyway guys thank you so much for joining us I hope you enjoyed it and we'll talk to you next time mm -hmm.